Welcome to Your Journey. I'm your host, Chuck Lewis, and we got a special guest with us today and Super Bowl champion, Dominic <laughs> Hickson. What's going on, man? Man, I'm chilling. Chuck, how you been, man? Man, I'm good, man. Uh, glad that you, you came on the show, man. Uh, it's been a lot, obviously, just trying to transition with everything going on with COVID-19. How have you transitioned, you and your family, with this pandemic? Yeah, man, I mean, it's been tough, you know, like it is, you know, for everybody. And uh, we actually had COVID, uh, you know, so we were down for a few weeks. But, you know, blessed to uh, not be hospitalized and, you know, hopefully doesn't have any long-term effects. But, you know, it was a scary moment there, you know, for a while, just not knowing uh, how, you know, the family is going to respond, you know, health-wise. So we're we're all healthy. We're, you know, we're back. And, uh, you know, so anybody out there, man, you can you can make it through. Mm -hmm. Now, nah, I appreciate you sharing that, man, and I'm glad that you made it through, that your family is safe. Um, I guess my next question is, is like, we're operating in this new normal. You know, will we ever get back to what normal used to be? Man, and you know, that's, that's a great question. Uh, you know, with what I'm doing, you know, business-wise and, uh, you know, doing some real estate stuff down here. From a real estate standpoint in Florida, you know, in Pensacola specifically, I mean, it ain't slowed down a bit. I mean, it's been really, really good. Uh, you know, so I mean, hopefully one day, uh, you know, and it, it's just going to take time. It's kind of, I think it's just weathering the storm now and uh, people just, you know, being, I guess, concerned of other people trying to do the right thing. And, you know, I know it's a frustrating time for a lot of folks, you know, business-wise. Nah, um, it's definitely a transition for everybody and everybody's trying to operate and figure out a new way to do work or do fun things with the family. So it's been a transition for everybody, but we have to look forward to the future and just look at this virtual way of operating from a work standpoint. So everybody's just trying to learn and adjust as things go and then as things change and hopefully a vaccine comes, comes soon and we, we can move forward and get better from there. But let's get right into it, man. So Dominic Hickson, uh, you actually grew up in Germany on a military base. What was it like growing up in Germany as a kid? <laughs> uh, it, it was different. You know, and I tell people, if you ever get a chance to go over there, uh, take advantage of it. It's just, it's a different feel, completely different outlook than anywhere in the United States. And uh, being part of a military family, you know, the whole discipline and all that, uh, you know, I think that helped me a lot throughout life. But uh, it's completely different. Like I said, it, it, was, it was great. You know, I still got my my grandmother and cousins and everybody back there. So, you know, I keep in touch with them, but uh, it was fun. Like I said, it was, it was really fun. And of course you learn how to play soccer before anything. So it was a good time. Now nah, that's good, man. So actually at the age of 12, your family transitions and moves to Columbus, Ohio. Talk about what that transition was like for you. Yeah. So, you know, when I was 11, I had uh, told my pops, I said, Hey, you know, I, I want to play college sports. Okay. And you know, he, he talked with, you know, talked with it with my mom and he was like, uh, you know what? He was like, uh, we're going to move. So we didn't know where we we're going to get moved to or stationed to. So yeah, ended up being the east side of Columbus, uh, Whitehall, uh, you know, is where we were stationed. And, uh, you know, the kind of journey began from there, but, you know, I appreciate my mom and my dad because we were comfortable in Germany. That's all, you know, uh, I had new. And like I said, he uprooted the whole family, you know, for, cause, cause his, his kid had a dream. You know, not not a lot of parents would do that, man. So I'm always thankful for, for that. No, that's big, man. So you've been an athlete pretty much your whole life. At what age did you start playing sports? So I started playing, shoot, I mean, four or five years old, we were playing soccer. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it was, you know, soccer in Germany that, that you, you were going to play in. Mm -hmm. uh, so we just kind of started off from there and then got into football, basketball, baseball, uh, you know, roller roller skating every, you know, Friday, Saturday type stuff. I mean, whatever I could do, you know, roller hockey, I wanted to do. And like I said, my parents, they made it happen for me. Uh, that's big, man. So you talked about transitioning to Columbus and then moving to the Whitehall area. You actually attended Whitehall High School. What was your experience like there as a student and as an athlete? You know, it was, it was great, man. I, I look back and uh, I had a lot of teachers that cared, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And, uh, it was just, it was past you know the the sports aspect or even the teaching, but just teaching life lessons. Mm. And uh, I still go back there now, you know, whenever I get a chance. And I was I was inducted to the Hall of Fame a few years ago, so I got to see a lot of them. Uh, but it's just one of those deals where uh, you know I hope my kids have that same opportunity with those teachers, and uh, they're very much appreciated. And uh, yeah, and I, I wouldn't I wouldn't do it any different. 
like I said, Whitehall, it, it was where I needed to be at. You know, just like later on in life, Akron was where I needed to be at. Right, right. So, like, most people uh, don't know, but you actually didn't really start playing football really until, like, your junior year. You played a little yeah. bit, like, as a youngster, but you really didn't start really getting into playing it at a high level really to, like, your junior year of high school. How did that all come about for you? You know, I always wanted to play, but if, if I showed you pictures of my eighth grade football, uh, I was the smallest kid on the team. Mm. And so, you know, ninth grade, uh, the same deal. Didn't get to play much eighth or ninth grade. And then my sophomore year, I was academically ineligible, but not by the school, but by my parents. They mm. said my grades were terrible, so they held me out. Uh, junior year, we get a new coaching staff. And so I played, you know, a little quarterback, but still not a big guy. You know, it just mm. I probably weighed 130 pounds, you know, 5'8 type mm. deal. So hit a huge growth spurt going into my senior year. And uh, that was really, you know, my, my one opportunity. But I still didn't think I was going to college for football. Right. Uh, I played baseball and basketball, and I thought I was going to do something in one of those sports. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as a guy playing, you know, he had it. Uh, Luke Fickle, mm -hmm. you know, coach who's coaching at Cincinnati now, he had recruited me uh, by accident. Mm -hmm. uh, they were recruiting our linebacker, uh, Anthony Jordan. He was number one, and I was number two. And he said, uh, I remember Coach Fickle, he was like, man, you, keep, you kept showing up on film, you know, making tackles and making plays. And he said, man, we need to offer this guy too. And so, again, that was my only offer, you know, my one opportunity and, you know, took advantage. Yeah, well, you definitely took advantage uh, of that. But you talked a little bit about playing other sports. So, actually, like in your senior year, uh, you were a basketball player. You actually earned all state honors in your senior year. You know, yeah. what did it mean to be able to be a guy that earned those honors in your senior year playing another sport? Yeah, I mean, it, and it was fun, man. And uh, what's heartbreaking about that, we were, were the number one seed in Columbus. We were ranked in the state, and we ended up not making it to state. You know, that's, I still – we still get back and talk about that, you know, with the guys and stuff. But, uh, no, it, it was fun, man. It was, it was an absolute blast our senior year. And I remember, like, you know, the student section, just, yeah. you know, almost that one of those varsity blues type, you know, everyone was rowdy. And, uh, you know, those memories you'll never forget, you know, especially your senior year. So, we were out there and, you know, we were having a lot of fun. No, nah, that's big, man. So, you accept the full athletic scholarship to go to the University of Akron. You know, what was that transition like in that first year going from Columbus to Akron, Ohio, and then also even from an academic standpoint and athletic standpoint? Yeah. And so from an athletic standpoint, I remember coming up there in the summer, and uh, a big reason, too, I was uh, excited to be up there is because Chase Blackburn. Mm. And so Jeez. we played against him my junior year, and he, you know, don't tell him this, but uh, he, <laughs> I mean, he dominated our team, man. It was just – and I'm like, man, if this guy is here – you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, Akron's about some type deal. So yeah. when I got up there in the summer, and so, you know, I grew a little bit. So now I'm 6'2", I think like 150 pounds. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, uh, K-Dub, uh, you know, he played safety. And so, we, you know, we were just talking to each other. But it was the whole unit that was uh, as a football team with uh, Brandon and everybody. It was just – it felt like a family atmosphere. Yeah. And so that was in the summer, which I thought was great. And then – from an academic standpoint, academics was never my strong suit because I always put it to the back burner. But, you know, after being in Elbrou my sophomore year, I kind of learned my lesson in high school. So I wanted to apply myself more. And, uh, and so, you know, so I did and, you know, I did the best I could. And, uh, yeah, there's a little more story to that later on. But, yeah, and, and like I said, it, it was a transition, but it was fun. Man. I, I enjoyed doing pretty much football for a living. You know what I'm saying? That's how I felt. I mean, you doing school, you know, you're on a, a scholarship, so you didn't have to financially pay for it. And so just try to make the most of it. But, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. No, it definitely had that family feel. I mean, you know, I played with you as well. And one of the reasons why I chose the University of Akron, because of that feel that I got of some of the guys that were on the team, like you mentioned some yeah. of the upperclassmen that were there, like in Brandon Payne and Jake Shafino and some of those other guys that were there. And that family environment is what drew me to going to the school. So we kind of got the same experience when we went up there and felt that family feel. Um, and that's why you were actually able to go on and, and transition and be successful. So your sophomore year, uh, you start all 12 games at safety. Uh, you helped the Zips get to a winning record that year. What went into that offseason for you to be able to help the Zips get to that level and for you as well to play as well as you did? Man, you know, it, just the grind. Uh, I remember Coach Bailey and Coach Westman, uh, 
you know, it was one of those deals where I was going to do every set of every rep of what they asked the best way, you know, the best I could. And, uh, you know, because they got me from my freshman year, uh, summer 150, to mm. then that following year, I was 200 pounds. That you is know, right. and I remember my parents were like, you know, what are they feeding you up there? But <laughs> it was one of those deals. I didn't want to leave any stone unturned. Yeah. And uh, just the competitiveness within our team. And I remember uh, one specifically against Chase, we were doing a shuttle drill, and I had dove over the line and beat him. Yeah. I remember we were arguing about that because he said, well, now you can't dive. And, you know, but it was, it was pushing each other. Right. You know what I'm saying? And like I said, it was just with that family atmosphere, that brotherhood, it was pushing each other, you know, to, to get to that eventual, you know, that MAC championship that we ended up winning. But it was like, you know, you got to take steps to get there. Now, nah, for sure. And a lot of people don't realize this, but actually at the end of that year, we had a winning season, but we had a coaching transition. So yeah. Lee Owens and his staff gets fired. J.D. Brookhart and his staff gets hired. Talk about what that transition was like for you personally. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Coach Owens, man, I mean, a, a great man on and off the field, you know, uh, in my opinion. And um, and so when he left, I remember uh, talking to Charlie about it, Charlie Fryer. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, what are you going to do? And I remember he was, you know, I may transfer, I may, you know, and it was just kind of untouched territory for everybody. And so uh, when Coach Brookhart came in, uh, you know, got to meet him and talk with him. and uh, But it was just different for everybody because now I didn't know that I was going to go from, you know, safety to all of a sudden now, you know, he brought me in his office to say, hey, we want you to play receiver. You know, and, it, and so, you know, just changes were happening. So it was a lot of uncertainty. I I felt like if I would have stayed at safety and, uh, you know, even could have moved the corner at, you know, 6'3", 200-something pounds, yeah. I thought that would be the best move for me personally. And I would, and you know, I tell, uh, tell friends that I said, man, if I'd have, you know, I could have been a six, three corner, yeah. you know, or safety, you know, but, but yeah, I mean, it was just a lot of uncertainty, but uh, the staff that he did bring in, even coach Moorhead who coached me at receiver, I mean, mm -hmm. tremendous. Yeah. And me and him still keeping contact, man. He was an offensive guru. Both of them were. Nah, and I definitely remember when that happened, too, because I think when the coaches first got there, they thought about actually playing you at corner. Uh, so, like, I think you were in the mix of just, like, at the beginning stage, we're, like, doing, like, one-on-one, seven-on-seven. Yeah. And then soon after that, you kind of went to the offensive side of the ball. Uh, but for some people that don't know, you know, what is that transition like? So, you know, playing on the defensive side yeah. and then going to the offensive side at the Division One level, you know, mm -hmm. talk about what that transition was like for you just from a skill set standpoint and then the things that you have to change from a focus and mentality. Yeah, so, I mean, now you go from, you know, emotional defensive side of the ball to a wide receiver offense where you got to be, you know, more controlled. And mm -hmm. uh, But now I'm playing catch up as far as technique goes. You know, I missed – uh, two years of, you know, of receiver technique, receiver drills. And so a lot of it was just raw. Uh, I, I had looked at uh, uh, some film, you know, a while ago, and I'm just looking, I'm like, gee, me, Chris. And it just, it didn't look good. You know, it was just right, like, right. wow. But, uh, you know, but again, credit to Coach Moorhead for, you know, working. And then again, uh, Jay Mont, uh, uh, Morris Ellington, uh, Marcus Patterson, I mean, yeah. Uh, uh, Anthony Dalton, all those guys who had played receivers. So now when we're in our receiver lines, I may go first or second, but I'm watching what they do. I'm right. learning from them. You know what I'm saying? I'm watching. I'm like, oh, shoot, he does that really well. You know, I need to go ahead. And, and so it was a learning process. But, you know, I learned from the guys in our group. Yeah, no, that's that's huge, man. Definitely the guys that's in your group, man, definitely help you make that transition. Yeah. And you were asked you to make that transition uh, pretty well. If I'm not mistaken, you caught like over 60 balls that year. I think you had maybe close to 800 yards receiving. So in one year, you were able to do that. Um, but in the midst of that year in your junior season, you played with Charlie Fry. You know, what was it like to play with Charlie Fry? Man, it was awesome, man. He uh, even throughout the summers and everything, again, he, he put that, that body of work in to be that good. And, you know, and that, that was the one thing that it wasn't, you know, he just didn't wake up and just show up for practice, but he did what he said type deal. And right. uh, we threw so many routes in the summer. You know, we worked out with, you know, the strength and conditioning staff, but then we also uh, did extra stuff, you know, right. and did extra film. And, and that's another thing, too, watching film. You know, he taught me what he was looking at as a quarterback. Uh, to be able to, you know, as a receiver to know what he's thinking and different things like that. Because we had a lot of option routes. 
Right. You know, it was one of those deals. If we weren't on the same page, then, you know, both of us going to look really bad. So, yeah. but no, it was great, man. Like I said, he's, you know, the OC in uh, Central Michigan now. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, he's doing a great job up there, you yeah. know. But, yeah, just in, in a study. Like I said, that dude, he studied film, you know, like he studied his books. Nah, for sure. Charlie Fry, definitely a student of the game. Um, and so in your senior year, uh, you helped the Zips win a MAC championship. Um, how did it feel to help the school capture history and to win a championship there? You know, it felt good, man. Uh, and what's wild is uh, I don't think that was our best team from the four years I was there. Yeah. You know, I look at our junior year, or excuse me, my, my sophomore year, uh, where we oh, had yeah. Matt Perry and Irvin, I mean, uh, Nick Sparks. I mean, we were loaded, yeah, you know. Sure. And I remember, you know, so – and I look at all that talent and, you know, for whatever reason, we just couldn't put it together. But then our, uh, you know, senior year, it's like, well, dang, I mean, now we're not as talented, but it was just something different about our team. We took advantage of opportunities. The ball bounced the right way. And, uh, and again, it was a, it was a team effort, you know, from a, I know from a receiver standpoint, specifically in the Mac championship game, when I go down with cramps, uh, Johnny Long comes in young guy. Yeah. You know, he comes and does his thing, and it's just like, yeah, I mean, we didn't skip a beat type stuff, and uh, and we didn't care who got the credit. You know, I remember uh, against Kent State, that Thanksgiving when it's snowing. Oh, and, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, it's just it's cold, you yeah. know, and I remember a coach coming up to us, and he was like, hey, we're not throwing the ball. Like, we're going to run the ball. So, you know, Brett Big, I don't know how many yards he rushed from me, but he was at, I mean, he was trucking behind the offensive line. Uh, and so it was just, you know, we didn't care. We wanted to win the game. And so, like I said, a lot of unselfish people. And so it was good to see all that hard work pay off. And like I said, in the, to win a, you know, MAC championship game. Because um, I got asked a question. They said, man, we, don't, we didn't see any pictures of you with the trophy. I said, man, I wanted to see all my, all my brothers. I just sat back and just watched and how happy everybody was, man. You know what I'm saying? I said, I just wanted to watch and, you know, maybe that one day I'll get a picture with it. But I said, man, it was just – it was nice to see all those guys celebrate. Yeah, and prior to us actually capturing the championship, uh, there's 17 seconds left on the clock. You make the, the game-winning TD catch. Yeah. <laughs> During the timeout, what's actually going through your mind? Like you talked about, you cramped up prior to that, right? Yep. There's 17 seconds left on the clock. You weren't in the game prior to that. What's going through your mind during that timeout? What are you thinking to go out there and and pretty much make the biggest play in Akron football history? Man, I mean, and and so I was praying the whole time, man. And uh, that's another thing, too. Our our Bible studies, uh, I thought were great. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm I'm sitting there and I'm just praying. I'm just asking God for an opportunity uh, to get out there. Because it hurts when you're not able to help. You know what I'm saying? And so knowing that I'm over there on the sideline and I got my brothers out there grinding, I just wanted to be able to help. And I remember praying and just saying, God, you know, I'll give you all the glory, the praise. Just, just give me a chance. And so when they called a timeout, I didn't know the, I didn't know the situation. Yeah. And so when we go in, uh, you know, I take a peek at the clock and I'm like, oh, it's, you know, it's game time type deal. And so yeah, yeah, yeah. the play we called, uh, you know, double post against cover four. I mean, everything worked from, you know, the protection to the throw right on the money. I'm just thankful I was able to catch it. I'd have been kicking myself in the butt if I didn't catch it. <laughs> nah, I mean, that was huge. And, and I just remember, like, watching that and, 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 like, that last play, all the things that led up to that, right? Yeah. And then just us being down in the game and for us to be able to have 17 seconds left on the clock, we got to make one play, and you made one of the biggest plays in the history. And everybody, like, talks about, like, you catching the ball, but it really was the route running. You know, and that's one of the things that I always said about you. People ask me, like, you know, who's some of the better guys you've been around? And you're one of the guys I always talk about. And one of the things that I say about you is, like, in college, you were adorable. You didn't miss a, miss a game in college. But your yeah. route running, you were one of the first guys I've seen that ran a 4-3, but ran your routes at 4-3 speed. You know what I mean? Uh, so that, that, uh, that, yeah. that, was, that was one of the things that, that I noticed about you. And then the deception in your route running, too. Like, mm-hmm. you know, and so the way that you were able to, get releases and then be able to be very deceptive in, in the way you ran your routes. And that's what led us to be able to win the match championship, but with your route running along with the other guys too, and then making big plays too. Like you mentioned, Brett Biggs and some of the other guys that made plays. And we had guys on defense, Reggie corner, Kiki Gonzalez. I mean, like you said, we just gelled together at the right time. Um, but you making the play that you did took us to the next level. And so in 2006, 
the NFL draft comes. All right, so you <laughs> go through Pro Day. Um, you do a great job there at Pro Day. Um, you get selected in the fourth round by the Denver Broncos. You know, how did it feel to get the call? Man, so Chuck, I don't and I don't know uh, if you knew or anybody. Uh, so my my pro day happened. Then they wanted to do another pro day for the teams that didn't come. Okay. And I broke my foot, mm-hmm. and I had to get surgery. And so I was in a boot going to these NFL visits. Wow. And uh, yeah, and, and so I remember after my first pro day when I was still healthy, a guy from Green Bay was like, "Young man, you just made yourself a lot of money." Wow. And I remember I, I walked down uh, back to the house and I was just walking. I was on cloud nine. And then like, you know, a week later, I do another pro day. You know, I break my foot. Mm-hmm. And so now I don't know if I'm going to get drafted. I don't, you know, but again, what, what guys playing, you know, has for you, you know, it's going to come. And, mm-hmm. and so uh, when I got that call, you know, again, I'm like, man, like, let's get it, man. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I actually, I got the boot off the day before. Mm-hmm. So I actually could wear shoes. And so, but yeah, I mean, I, like I said, Coach Shanahan calling you, asking if you want to play, you know, with the Denver Broncos, man, yeah. you sign me up. Yeah. I'd go yeah. anywhere. <laughs> yeah. So right. I started looking yeah. Denver up on the map and seeing, right. seeing what I needed to do. Yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> no, that's good, man. And uh, uh, you mentioned God. And I know faith has played such a huge role in, in your life. You know, as, as the years have went on, you know, what actual role has like your relationship with God and what has it done for you to help you to be where you are today? You know, it, it keeps me, keeps me grounded and, and it keeps me going. Uh, Cause you know, life's tough, man. I mean, it is. Uh, it is. you you have your ups and downs. Like we was talking about earlier. I mean, there's some great times and some bad. And so during the bad times, I want to make sure that I respond the right way, you know, and, sure. uh, Guys, and I always say, man, God has a plan for you, and he'll never forsake you, you know. And so it's one of those deals where, again, you know, and we can get into it later on, but some things have happened in my life that I'm just like, without God, I don't know where I would be at today, you know. And uh, and I tell young men that all the time that are going through stuff, and I'm just like, man, just, you know, continue to pray, you know, and, and just do your best, you know. But, yeah, and so, like I said, even me getting drafted, to the Broncos with a broke foot. Yeah. There are a lot of other healthier receivers out there, but you know, God just had that plan for me, you know. So, yeah. But yeah. No, it definitely seems like it served as a good foundation for you, man, throughout That's your true. life. Um, and then as you transition into your first year in the NFL, what was that transition like? Here it is. Yeah. You 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 play four years in college. You played the defensive side of the ball the first couple of years. Then you played the offensive <laughs> side of the ball the, the, your last two years. Um, and then you, you you wound up in Denver playing with the Denver Broncos, and then you go in there with an injury. You know, what was yeah. that first year like for you? Man, it, I really got to see the business side of football. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I get there. We do, uh, like, the rookie stuff, but they're not letting me practice. And so I get to where I feel healthy and I'm ready for training camp. And, again, they're like, no. And I'm like, you know, well, why? And so the, the political side and the, the business side of football comes out. Uh, they wanted to give another guy opportunity uh, to play, you know, receiver. So uh, they pretty much sat me out for most of that year, and I got to practice a little bit. Uh, but, yeah, I was just kind of – you know, my eyes were opened up. Because, you know, at, it was just, hey, I'm playing for fun, but now you're playing for money. Now you got an agent working for you. Now, you know, and it's just – you know, it was it was a lot to take in. And uh, But, again, kind of like that Akron, you know, upperclassman, we had uh, Rod Smith a receiver, Javon Walker, uh, Ian Gold. Uh, you know, it was those guys. I remember sitting down with uh, having lunch with them and them just talking about the business side of football, about saving your money, uh, about, you know, pretty much no loyalty to, you know what I'm saying, and just, you know, putting you up on game. Yeah. You know, so uh, I was thankful, you know, to be there. But, uh, yeah, that wasn't – just wasn't the place for me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so actually in 2007 and seven you actually uh, get released by the broncos and then you get picked up by the new york giants talk yeah. about what that transition was like going from denver to new york city yeah so uh yeah I, you know and what ended up happening uh so our first game against the bills we play at the bills mm-hmm. i'm starting punt and kick return yeah. uh you know i'm playing with champ bailey you know brandon marshall and so 
like all my dreams are now coming true. My first, you know, game in the NFL. And then uh, the second half on the kick return, uh, me and Kevin Everett collided. Right. And he ends up, uh, you know, being paralyzed. And, uh, and I remember I just wasn't, I wasn't right uh, mentally after that happened. You know, you, you change someone's life uh, in such a dramatic fashion. And a lot of stuff was just going through my head. And, again, you know, the uh, praying uh, for him and, you know, just to be able to walk with his kids and do different things with his kids. And I remember uh, calling my parents because they, they were at the game. But I remember that next day calling my parents and was like, hey, I'm going to finish this season out. But I was like, I'm done with football. Wow. And they were like, oh, okay. And uh, so fast forward to a few weeks later, we get done playing the Colts. And, uh, you know, they called me and they fired me. Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, I called my parents again. I said, hey, and I just just had bought a house uh, at the end of August Mm -hmm. in Denver. So I, I get fired, you know, two months later. Right. And uh, and so I remember talking to him, and I said, "Hey, listen, they fired me." I was like, "I th- I just think I'm done now." Yeah. And I remember my dad. You know, s- some things uh, you you don't want to hear, but you need to hear. And my pops was like, "Hey, uh, son," he was like, "God didn't bring you this far to just you know just leave you here." Right. You know, continue to pray for Kevin. Continue to pray for his family. Mm-hmm. He's like, and God, you know, God, will, you know, make it right. Right. And I remember I was like, you know what, man, and you know, and Swallow my pride, and I said, you know what? Well, if something happens, something happens. Next day, they call me, and they say, hey, you know, the New York Giants uh, you know, want you on the team. I say, all right. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> they actually – the Broncos fired me to keep who is now my best friend, Brian Clark. Wow. Me and him are still friends to this day, but, yeah, it's a, that's a whole nother story. But uh, <laughs> so uh, he actually takes me to the airport. Uh, I go there and I was like, hey, you know, Dominic Hickson, you know, I'm flying out to New York. And the guy was like, you're flying out to Newark, New Jersey. Mm. I was like, no, I'm flying out to New York yeah. to be part of the Giants. And the guy yeah. was like, he was like, you do realize they play in New Jersey. I'm like, no, yeah. I don't. <laughs> so, you know, and so I laugh about that all the time. Yeah. But uh, so I take a red eye out there. You know, we leave at, you know, seven, eight o'clock at night. I get there at like four in the morning, get off the plane, straight to the facility. We get there by about six o'clock. I got to see that New, New Jersey, New York traffic. <laughs> uh, get there about 6 a.m. Yeah. and, you know, and start getting after it. And uh, one of the reasons that New York picked me up, uh, Thomas McGahey, he's a special teams coach, and he was the assistant out in uh, Denver. And so he had seen me run and, you know, and, me and him had had conversations, but he went to the GM and said, hey, we need to pick this guy up. Yeah. yeah. So, again, God's plan, you know what I'm saying? And it's one of those deals where, you know, he, in a sense, he put his, you know, credibility on the line. And, you know, we joke about it now, you know, to this day, like, you know, I gave him credibility. And I said, well, you gave me the opportunity. I just wanted to, you know, do my best for yeah, that. So, yeah. Yeah, no, nah, and uh, you actually uh, uh, paid it back uh, in the season finale. Uh, against the New England Patriots, who, if I'm not mistaken, that year uh, they they were chasing history by trying to go undefeated, uh, yeah. right? Um, and so you score your first NFL touchdown on a kick return. You know what did that moment feel like for you? Uh, it felt like an out of body experience, man. Uh, the week before, uh, so my motivation where where it came from the week before uh, we played Buffalo. And so where Kevin and I had collided and I actually met him uh, after the game and me and him got to, got to talk and, and have a conversation. And uh, I just remember him saying like, Hey man, like it's not your fault, man. Yeah. Like, you know, and, and that took a lot of weight off of my shoulders because I, I didn't, I still didn't enjoy the game, yeah. but after me and him had that conversation and, you know, he sp- spoke some words of wisdom to me. I mean, my whole, body language and everything just changed. And I was, you know, I was like, man, I'm, I'm going to go have fun. Yeah. And so I was, man, I was pumped up to be Thursday night undefeated Patriots. Uh, you know, and y'all letting me touch the ball, man. I mean, like I said, it's, it's what you dream of as a kid. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> nah, it was big. I remember watching that on TV and just, you know, being a former teammate of yours, you know, watching you go out there and perform like that. And then what well, people don't realize the adversity. I'm glad you shared that story about, you know, 
thinking about walking away from the game. You, you yeah. know, the team you got drafted to, you get injured, you know, to, prior to you even getting there. You know, the first year is rough, and then you kind of like finally get to your second year and you're playing, and then you have that situation happen with Kevin. And then your whole mindset at that point is you're not even sure if you're going to continue to play. And then right. you to get a call, you know, a couple of days later or whatnot. Um, and then even you just going to the airport and getting there and then be thrown right into the mix. And then for yeah. by the end of the year, man, you could perform the way that you did in that game. And I remember watching that touchdown. That was big for me just to be able to know that, man, to see one of my guys, and I see you come in at 150 pounds at after, <laughs> to be on center stage and, and, and perform like that. Um, so it gets even better that year. Uh, so later on in the year, uh, you play a role in helping the Giants win the Super Bowl. What yeah. did it feel like to play in the Super Bowl? And then also I got another question for you. What do you got in the headset, man? What are you listening to before the Super Bowl <laughs> to get you hyped up for the game? Um, and what did the whole moment feel like for you, man? And then you actually won the Super Bowl. Talk about that whole experience. Man, so, uh, like, music-wise, I played a little bit of everything. Uh, but it was more or less just the past time. Yeah. Uh, you know how competitive we were, man. I didn't, you know, I don't need music to pump me up. I don't need, you know, it's one of those deals. Uh, I'm just so competitive that, you know, whoever lines up across from, like, I, I you don't, that's the, all the motivation I need. But right. uh, we listen, you know, of course, all the New York rappers, uh, Jay-Z, uh, Jada Kiss, I mean, you name it, Locks, all, you know what I'm yeah. saying? And uh, Joe Budden. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was so I never made it to the playoffs in high school. Wow. So, and then, you know, at Akron we won, mm. uh, you know, the MAC championship, so we went to a bowl game. But I never – so the whole playoff was was new to me. Yeah. And so it was like, oh, win and go – you know, win or go home type deal. And uh, it, it just felt like every play was that much more important. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I remember uh, Amani Toomer, uh, him and uh, Plexico, uh, two of my mentors when I was there, yeah. and. Uh, I remember Amani saying, he was like, listen, and he was talking to the young guys. He said, the season ain't over because we made the playoffs. Yeah. He said, uh, he said, you get to party or do whatever you do. He said, you get to do that in February. Mm. He said, you, this, this opportunity doesn't come, come by too often. He said he was a part of a team that had lost in the Super Bowl years before. Mm -hmm. He said, that's the most sickening feeling. He said that, you know, because I mean, he got an NFC championship ring. And he said he put that in the back of the closet somewhere. He said it's just a sick feeling. Yeah. He said so every week, you know, you take it one week at a time. And then when we end up going to the Super Bowl, it's one of those deals. He said, we're here now, man. We got to cash in. Yeah. And then go enjoy yourself. But and, and the, so the reason I bring that up, the leadership, uh, because I think that that lacked – after you know 2012 2013 i said man they they had some really good opportunities and it seemed like they were focused on other things you know so uh but yeah so leadership so actually later on in your career um you end up tearing your acl in the summer of 2010 um and then you rehab from that and then at the beginning of 2011 you tear it again you know mm -hmm. what was that process like going through rehab mentally and physically yeah uh and so again Amani uh I remember him he, he was in uh Columbus and we got up this was in 2010 mm -hmm. uh we got up uh, together and grabbed some food and we were talking and he said physically you'll be fine he's like you'll come back you'll be fine he's like but from a mental standpoint uh you know keep replaying what happened in your head and you being successful at it and uh you know and and I appreciated that because it did help me out. Uh, what, what a lot of people, 99% of the people don't know is that my mom was battling cancer. Wow. And so my mom, she loved to come to the games. Like that was her, you know, her getaway. And uh, I just remember like her battling cancer and I'm just like, now she can't go to the games. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just, and like I said, it was, it was just such a, a mental a mental deal. And cause I remember coming down to Pensacola, Florida with Dr. Andrews doing rehab there. And I remember her coming down and it was just, it was, again, it was more about family than it was football at that time. Cause I remember, uh, I'm sure people were wondering why I wasn't at the facility as much and stuff like that. But, you know, I was like, you know, my mom's battling too. 
you know, she battling some way worse than me. And right. when I came back from the second ACL, a reporter had asked me, you know, oh, well, you know, how, how'd you do it? And I'm like, man, people out there, you know, my mom specifically battling for their life. Right. You know, ACL, I'm going to be all right. Yeah. You know, like, so it was just one of those deals where there were just so much, you know, bigger things happening that, uh, you know, like I said, it, it just seemed real small, you know, ACL. Yeah, like, and I, I'm glad you shared that, too, because, like, a lot of people don't understand what goes on behind the scenes. All they yeah. see is Sunday afternoon or Sunday night or the Super Bowl, and mm -hmm. they just see the bright lights. But I, right. outside of that, sometimes that's the only piece you have is being in between yeah. the lines, right? Um, but all the stuff that's going on, in the midst of that, you're battling, you know, your injury, but more importantly, you're dealing with your mother's health. And those are things that you're trying to deal with mentally. And sometimes it's hard to find the right individual to even talk to about that, you know, or who yeah. even understands that, you know? Yeah. And so in the midst of all that, you're trying to manage your life, but then also trying to be supportive for your parents and things of that nature. Um, and so in 2013, uh, you make a transition and you sign with the Carolina Panthers. You know, what was that experience like playing there? And then what was the experience like playing with Cam Newton? Yeah. So uh, the GM, uh, and Carolina at that time was David Gettleman. He came from uh, the Giants, and he was part of the process that brought me there from the Broncos. And so I followed him down there. And uh, so, yeah, now you get to play with uh, Steve Smith and, you know, and uh, uh, Cam Newton. And it was, it was a, a great, fun time. I got a picture hanging up of the receivers with Steve Smith. Because, you know, and you, you hit something on the head where you say you just get to see a piece. Right. And so, you know, when, when you say, oh, yeah, I play with Steve Smith, you know, a lot of people kind of give, you know, they look at you like, oh, well, how was that? I'm like, that dude, it's a great dude, man. Yeah. Like, you know, so, I mean, and it's, you know, so the perception on the reality and uh, but yeah, it was fun. And uh, me and Cam, we had lockers next to each other. And uh, that's a big dude, man. Yeah. I mean, straight up. I mean, he big, fast, can throw the whole <laughs> nine yards. And I mean, yeah, he, he's probably. If you would look at him, you'd think he was a, I mean, a D tackle, D end. I mean, he's just a big dude. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's like Brandon Jacobs playing quarterback. <laughs> I mean. Crazy, man. That's crazy. And uh, so in 2014, you sound with the Chicago Bears. And then a few months later, you decide to walk away from the game and retire from football. You know, what ultimately puts you in the mindset to make that decision? So uh, something that I had prayed, I was like, Lord, you know, after coming back from two ACLs, I said, I'm going to do all I can. You know what I'm saying? I need your help. You know, I straight I just, I need your help. And so um, my son was born April 15th mm. of that same year. And so uh, when I tore my knee, uh, so because what I was doing, I was, uh, I'd be in, you know, Chicago for some time and actually uh, was staying in uh, D.C., and so I'd, I'd be in Chicago. I work out Monday to Thursday morning, and then I'd fly fly and go see him, you know, for the weekend. Then I fly back, and I kept doing that, you know. So when I tore my knee again, I just was like, you know, I, I feel like this is a sign. And so, uh, and plus, I was like, man, I'd rather spend some time with my son anyway. But, uh, but so again, everything happens for a reason. Uh, my mom's cancer had came back. And so this time it came back as bone cancer. And so when I retired, I didn't know that. But um, from me retiring, you know, in that June or whenever it was, uh, it was pretty much, you know, 14 months from then my mom was going to pass and I didn't even know it. And so I had an opportunity to spend ample time with her. You know, I was retired, didn't know what I wanted to do uh, further in life. I uh, got to spend time with my son. Uh, you know, and the thing is, uh, you know, like you said, the what you're going through, you know, at the time I'm going through a, a divorce and a custody battle, uh, you know, and all this is happening, you know, after you retire from an NFL career, you know. And so when kids ask me or, you know, one kid told me, man, you must have had a perfect life. You know, I'm like, well, let's let's sit down and talk, you know, what I'm saying type deal. But, uh, you know, and everything ends up, you know, working itself out. Um, but yeah, if I if you want me to talk and elaborate about my mom's deal and how Yeah, feel free, man. Okay, uh so um so 
in September. So I retired in uh, uh, June. So, you know, 14 months from then, that next September, uh, everything's situated with the, you know, divorce or custody stuff. Uh, and I remember my mom wanting to see, uh, to see Lorenzo, my son. Yeah. And that's all she, you know, at this point in time, she was bedridden. The doctor said there's nothing else that they could do. Right. And, uh, and, but there was still some friction between me and his mom and, um, ends up being that in December, uh, we got ordered. Long story short, he he spent the last 21 days of her life we had spent in Ohio with her, and uh, she got to be with her grandson. Um, and I remember uh, when he he had got picked up, we had to do the exchange. And just being that, my mom, uh, she died that next day. Wow. You know, and and so all this happened. And again, you know, people were, oh, I can't believe you're tired from football and all this stuff. And I said it couldn't have been better. You know what I'm saying? I got to spend 14, you know, 15 months with my mom, you know, hanging out and, you know, just enjoying the last, you know, time she has on earth. Now, I appreciate you sharing that. And again, it, it goes to, again, the behind the scenes things that go on that a lot of people aren't aware of. You know, they see you because they because you're a guy that is is always smiling like you, you never have a bad day. Even though there's a there's a lot that has went on in your life. You know, and there's some things that I knew just from playing with you. But there's a lot of things I didn't know what happened after you left Akron. And yeah. you're a guy that, man, you kind of walk through life with a smile. And you're, you're one of those guys that I say, like, man, it never seems like you have a bad day. That's probably why, like, why that guy said that to you because you're just yeah. always in a good, positive mood. But a lot of that has, has to do with your upbringing. But behind the scenes, man, the things that one is going through, you know, yeah. you're, you're not only trying to figure out, like, what's going to be the next step with your mom and life without your mom, but then you're also mm -hmm. like, what is, what is my life like after football, right? right. And so you retired yeah. from the NFL. <laughs> what has life been like outside of football? It, it's been a, it's been a search process. Uh, and this may get a little long winded again, Chuck, just let me that's know. But, uh, hey, that's what it's for. Uh, and so, because what, what ended up happening, I left Akron and I didn't graduate from there. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, they wanted me to come do a internship at Akron during my NFL career. Well, I mean, you can't do that. And so I was really disappointed at the fact that I, you know, and I didn't end up getting my degree. Um, and so now that I'm retired, I had a buddy who retired before me, the same guy who took my spot in Denver, Brian Clark. Yeah. And uh, I remember him going to work and, um, you know, he had played five years in the league. And he was like, he calls me up one day after he gets a paycheck. And he was like, you wouldn't believe this. I'm like, what's up? You know, he's a family of four. And he told me how much he was making. And I was like, oh. Yeah. I'm like, he's like, that's real world stuff. And this was while I was still playing. So I knew for me, corporate America, uh, it'd be a long process to go back, get my degree, you know, to do all that stuff. And so I was like, well, you know, how, how can I make money? Uh, yeah, right. And so I ended up doing real estate. And so what I did was uh, I bought rental properties. Uh, and I'm thankful for my high school coach who's now one of my best friends, Milan Smith. I remember uh, I was buying rental properties. You know, he was showing me how to, you know, what to do, the ins and outs about it. And so I was like, well, this sounds like a good deal. So that's where I started at. Now, it went full certain. Now I do real estate uh, in Pensacola in Florida. So anybody need a house bought or sold, let me know. Yeah. Uh, and so, so I do real estate. Uh, we do charter fishing. And so I take people out fishing uh, uh, on our boat and then uh, also have a, a tree and uh, land clearing company. So we wow. trim trees, cut down trees, remove trees, do the whole land stuff. I mean, you name it, uh, earth moving, we do. Uh, but it's been a process, man. I, I thought for, you know, for sure, I was like, oh, man, you know, I, I know what I'm doing in two or three years. Yeah. I mean, it, it took, you know, five, six years to yeah. really – like hey this is what i want to do this is what you know i enjoy and uh but yeah i mean it, it, it's it's a different feeling you go from people you know even uh i tell people the story with doctors so in the nfl if you got hurt or something they sent you to the doctor they sent a uh, doctor to the training room you were in and out yeah man. i remember coming down here i had my first checkup and uh i was in the waiting room for like two hours yeah, yeah, yeah. and i'm just like man like, what's going on and i'm just like man, Welcome to the real world. Right, you know? right, right. No, for sure. Um, 
a, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, I think um, obviously uh, you're a teammate of mine, a friend of mine, and then, you know, watching you make that transition. But I've had other friends that played at the next level and made the transition. And what mm-hmm. people don't realize and what every individual that has had to make the transition like yourself that I know is you're starting all over again because the one life as you knew it, it almost like it dies, right? right. And, then you, and then you're like starting another life, but you're trying to fit into this game of life and you're trying to find, you know, your next career path. And the way that you handle issues and problems in the workforce, as you know, is completely different in the way that you handle them in football, right? You can't just go in there and say, hey, man, I'm going to go get some extra reps in on the bench or I'm going to work on my backpedal. You know, you're dealing with people and trying to manage businesses and things of that nature. But the toughest part is everybody's already been playing in the game already. This is a different game. Oh, so it. Everybody gets that head start on you. So you know, I, was, I was in, you know, for nine years. And I'm like, and so, and that's what my, my, my buddy Brian said. He was like, man, he said, I have a boss that's younger than me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He was like, I'm, you know, 28 years old. I said, you know, and, and it's just like, and so you're absolutely right, Chuck. You hit it on the head, man. Everyone got that head start on you. And so now, you know, what do you want to end up doing? And yeah, I mean, you hit it right on the head, man. Yeah. No, and so you're just trying to like find where do you fit in at? You know, it's like, you know, financially is it a good move you know and then if you have family like you did um when you transition now you know you know what's the best place for me to transition that's going to be a good area for my kids good school i mean you're thinking about all those things to when when you're in the nfl it's kind of like hey i'm in this city playing for these two years and then hey i'm in another city and then you get first class treatment right yeah. <laughs> and so oh, yeah. it all that's changes <laughs> yeah yeah for sure it all changes but um you've been able to transition and go into another direction a, a different direction than most so you're the owner of Super Bowl Fishing, which is a yeah. deep sea fishing business. Talk yeah. about how that all came about, man, and how you develop a passion for fishing. So while I was in the NFL, uh, I remember uh, I was like, man, I you know I like a, a boat or like a little plane to fly around, right? So uh, me and Fl- I did that just didn't seem right. So I was, so I went and got into boats, and uh, I just enjoyed being out on the water, super relaxing, um, and so. I had a boat in Ohio while I lived up there. And then when I moved down here, uh, I enjoyed fishing. We just combined the two. But uh, I, I got a buddy down in the Keys, uh, uh, Captain John. His boat's called That's Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I went down there for the first time on a charter. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this is what you do for a living? He said, man, we do like, you know, a ton of trips a year. Da, da, da. And I said, oh, well, that sounds like fun. So I went and got my captain's license, mm-hmm. uh, went and got a boat. and you no, know, we've been doing it ever since. And, I mean, it's a blast uh, for the people that do it full-time. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, my hat goes off to you because, again, it's a grind. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, with the weather and just the, the challenges that it has in itself. But, mm-hmm. uh, but no, it's fun. And we do dolphin cruises. And my wife, she loves to be out on the boat. Mm-hmm. Daughter, son. I mean, it's just it's a good family time. Yeah. yeah. That's good, man. It sounds like you're transitioning in that. Uh, pretty well. So we're going to move to the last segment of the show. It's one of my favorite segments of the show. It's the top five segment. So I got some categories for you and some questions. You give me your top five <laughs> in those areas. So starting off with the first question, Dominic, right. Hitchin, you play wide receiver. Give me your top five wide receivers of all time. Of all time? It could be your favorite five too. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Uh, hmm. Top five. So I'm going to start off uh, Jason Montgomery. All right. Jay Listen, Mon- let me tell you, man, uh, we used to say he catches BBs in the dark. And I wasn't able to <laughs> yeah. make his wedding this year yeah. uh, because of the whole COVID stuff. But, yeah. uh, man, I mean, that, that dude could flat out play football. Great guy off the field, man. And, yeah. uh, you know, congratulations on him getting married. But like I said, receiver, like I, said, I learned a lot from him, uh, you know, playing alongside him. Uh, I think Hopkins. Right now, Hopkins is hot out there in Arizona with uh, Kyler Murray. Uh, you know, and then I I got to throw in my guy, Amani Toomer. Yeah. Plexico Burrs, both of those guys. Uh, I mean, they just, like I said, they flat out play football, man. And uh, they both did it a long time at a high level really well. Yeah. And uh, like I said, I was blessed to know them. Uh, and then shoot the the fifth one. Uh, hmm. 
You know, someone who I enjoy watching was uh, Brandon Stokely. Yeah, yeah. I did for that short amount of time. Uh, but I can name a dozen more. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Brandon, he used to, he used to his one on one routes in the slot. Man, he was he was <laughs> slick. He was slick with it. <laughs> nah, he definitely was, man. He was a big time player, especially in the slot. Um, but my second question is: is you were a big time basketball player in high school? We used to play basketball. When you talked about the Bible studies, remember we used to go to Bible study for you know, a half an hour or so, and then we get out there and play basketball. You, uh, myself, uh, Charlie Fry, and a bunch of guys, but. Give me your top five NBA players of all time. Ooh. Uh, Got to start off with Michael Jordan. Uh, definitely. Um, so, in no, in no particular order, because I'm sure we could sit here for hours and talk about that. <laughs> Kevin Garnett. Yeah. Um, LeBron James. I mean, I mean, you know, he, he, he does this thing year in and year out. Uh, guy I like to watch is uh, Derrick Rose. You know what I'm saying? I know he has some injuries and different things. Uh, then, shoot, Shaquille O'Neal will go yeah. Shaq. Yeah. yeah, those five. No particular order. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's a good five right there. All those guys are, are going to be first, ho- first battle Hall of Famers, especially when LeBron's done. Uh, so that's a good five right there. So during your time playing in the league and just in college and just in life, like you grew up in Germany and, and things of that nature, but give me the top five places you've ever visited or vacationed. Huh, that's a good question. Uh, so Germany would be uh, Germany would be in the top five. Um, Colorado Springs, uh, where me and my wife got married at, a place called Garden of the Gods. Yeah. Unreal, man. Uh, my brother, he's out there. My sister-in-law stuff, but uh, yeah. So check that out if you got some time. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Where else? Um, shoot, Pensacola, Florida. It's a little hidden gem down here. It ain't got the nightlife of, of a Miami or something like that, but uh, emerald blue water, uh, just a nice family atmosphere. So Pensacola would definitely be up there. Two more. Um, oh, Brazil. Uh, went to Rio. Uh, we did a mission trip down there, and uh, unbelievable, man. I mean, just the, just the natural – Mountains, I mean, just unreal uh, down there and the people. Uh, where else? Hmm. Oh, and so I haven't been there. Uh, has sent my parents there, but Fiji. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. So uh, it, yeah. one day I told, you know, I said, me and my wife, I said, we're going we're gonna to go there. We're going we're gonna to make it, you know, halfway around the world or whatever it is. But I'd <laughs> like to go to Fiji. So that, that's my one to go place. No, that's nice, man. Those are some good places right there that I would like to go to as well at some point. Um, so the last question, give me your top five movies of all time. Oh, you know, it was so bad. I and mean, I used to love to go to the movies. This pandemic happened. Yeah. Uh, shoot, probably anything that uh, Denzel started. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, from John Q to Training Day. Yeah. Uh, shoot, that, I mean, yeah, any anything that he plays and I'm willing to watch and, and put him in, uh, in the top five. Uh, I like the movie 300. Mm. Uh, that was that was a good one. Uh, movie, yep. Let me see. I got to get you one more. Um, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Like Brooklyn's Finest. Brooklyn's Finest uh, was that good. Was solid. That yeah. Was solid. yeah, I saw that at the theater. That was good. Yeah. Uh, let me see. That's probably all I can. Oh, all that's, I can do now. Now let me say. Um, uh, what's that called? Uh, Blacklist. Okay. On TV? Oh, now, yeah, yeah, TV? Yeah. Dude, they need to make a movie out of that. That's a yeah. bad dude. Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, for sure. No, that's a good one. They definitely need to make a movie out of that one for sure. No, that's yeah. good. Well, nah, man, Hicks, man, I appreciate you coming on the show, man. We're at the end here. Uh, one of the reasons why I selected you is because of your journey, and it's been an unbelievable journey, man. You've been through uh, a lot of great times, but you've also been through some adversity like you shared. And a lot of times in, in our lives, Everybody focuses so much on like the A-list celebrities, which we got love for them, right? Yeah, but yeah. there's so yeah. many people out here making a difference 
day in and day out, man, with some of the things that you've done outside of football. So you talked about what you're doing with your fishing company, man, and some of the things that you're doing in real estate, but also like the camps that you've had too back in Columbus and stuff with the kids and things of that nature, mission trips and things of that nature. And so we want to make sure that we highlight those things. We want to make sure that we share stories, man, that highlights individuals, man, their great times, but also how they handled adversity along the journey, right? So that was one of the reasons why I selected you, man. And I just want to tell you, man, that keep doing what you're doing. Uh, a lot of times we wait till people pass away to give them their flowers, or I like to say, give them their crown. We're going to give you your crown today, man. We appreciate all the work uh, that you're doing. And even for me, uh, watching from the side, you probably never knew this, but I just remember, man, one of the things about your journey, man, your work ethic, man. You know, I just remember we used to run one tens in college, man. And like, I remember we like, we have like 21 tens and I'm like over another lane. So you're in the first group. So I'm in the third group. And I remember just like running down and I would just see how like you, you would like run the one ten, and you're like talking about what you're going to eat later. Like you were just so in shape, man. You almost like operated like a machine. You never missed a rep. And then also the attention to detail, the route running, man. You probably are the best route runner that I've been around. A guy that actually seen run his routes at four, three speed. Right. And so those are just some of the sidebar things that a lot of people didn't get a chance to see unless they play with you. But, man, you have an unbelievable journey. You have a great story. You haven't even hit your prime yet, man. So I salute you and want to give you your crown today, man. Thanks for coming on. Hey, I appreciate you having me, Chuck, man. Thank you. Nah, for sure, man. Well, thanks, everyone, for tuning into your journey. Be safe and God bless.